You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, God damn it! Get the point good. And now... Bend over. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Woohoo! Yeah, when you're hot, you're hot. And oh my lord, <laughs> it was nice this morning. What the hell? You'd think it's freaking summer or something. Jeez, oh Pete. Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 3. And it's rather blustery and warm out here in Grammy land. And uh, it's supposed to get a lot hotter, hot, hot, hotter tomorrow, <laughs> and not in a fun way. 102 is what they're saying for my temp tomorrow. Damn, I would be running a fever. <laughs> I got a fever. Oy. Yeah, I'm also over on Spreaker. And by the way, if you're listening in over on the RLM channel on Spreaker, please come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Join the chat. Think of a nickname. Give me some static, because... I, I don't have good enough internet to have that many chat rooms going. And, oh, Lord, I got a lot of tabs open already. <laughs> I could be in trouble. Okay, so over here on Twitter, thank you, Barman, for treating me out. Treating me out? Tweeting me out. I truly do appreciate it, hon. Yes, I am live and in person. Or in poison. Or I'm, I'm, I'm in something. I'm something. In any case... Uh, yeah, thanks, Barman, and I gained a couple more stalkers. Woohoo! Although I think I've, one of them ran away really quick once they start checking out some of the shit that I post. Because I'm all over the place when I post stuff. You know, it, it's it's just one of them there things where it's like, I like this, and I like this, and I like, oh, 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 and Robert De Niro. Man, he is catching all kind of static lately. Dropping F-bombs like crazy. Robert De Niro, how dare you? Shame, shame, shame. Okay, uh, let's see, what? Oh, let's see. I gotta, I gotta grab this one here, too. In any case, let's see, over here on this effing site. Who's over here on this effing site? I see Java, 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 Java Doctor is over here. I also see Grimner. Thank you, Grimmy, for sharing me. Once again, you the bomb, you the man, you the big kaboom. That's all there is to it. Damn it. I also see Bobby is over here. And uh, late in, yeah. Oh, and guess what? Robert De Niro got caught using a prostitution ring that specializes in children. Oops. That's on Neon Nettle. Hmm, I'm not real sure. Hmm, not real sure about that site wouldn't put it past him but you know just because it specializes in children doesn't necessarily mean that he knows that it does and that he requested them I haven't read the article I just read the headline <sighs> although I do think yeah hmm, he's one of them wishy-washy people you know because first it was you know anti-vax and then it was not anti-vax and then it was anti this and then it was not anti this and then it was like really dude get off the freaking fence you're becoming a pain in your own ass let alone the asses of everyone else okay let's see I got two more woohoo woohoo okay over here on Facebook Tessa got six day timeout over on Twitter and you know why? Because she said that she thinks politicians should be publicly hung for treason. <laughs> you go, Tessa. <laughs> That's just too funny. Yeah. She's just, she just too funny. I love you, Tessa. You're so cool. You just flat ass say it. Okay, uh, let's see, who else is over here on Fakie Book? Not really a whole heck of a lot of anybody. It's been very slow on Fakie Book lately. I think I'm getting shadow banned, is what I think. I think that I post things and nobody sees them. Huh, 
imagine that. Okay, over here on minds. Hello, minds. If you don't mind, it don't matter. That's called mind over matter. Um, and thank you, RLM, for sharing it over there. I did not get to your page to see it yet, but I know you always do. Rascal, honey, I love you, but when you reach up, no claws, okay? Because claws hurt, especially on the neck. I know, I have to scold my key cat. She's on my lap. Ow! She's so loving, and yet, ow! Uh, oh, cool. Okay, ouch. Dang cat. Let's see. That's mine. That's Facebook. That's, that's freaking wrong. That's, oh, good God. I'm scrolling. Can you tell? Offended? I'm sorry. Not. <laughs> Okay, Facebook, Twitter, FN site, Minds. Ah, Informed Planet. I haven't been to Informed Planet for a while. And Circle sent me a link. Hi, everybody over on Informed Planet. I've been checking them out today. And actually, I've been really enjoying the stuff posted over there a lot more than I have Minds. But, you know, mm, that's just me. That's just me. Okay. Is that all of the social sites that I need to be getting to? I think so. Oh, uh, De Niro, De Niro, De Niro. You're dropping lots of F-bombs instead of De Niro. Okay, what? Um. Ah, cool beans, Frumpy. <laughs> I know, Graham. Everybody else says it, too. Um, uh, treating me to a tweeting. Who, baby? Hey, I see a bubbler going on, too. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, hey, Beetle. I see you're, don't be throwing nothing, hon, because you'll have to pay for it later. Okay, let me see. Where am I at? Where am I at? Oh, yeah. Okay. Never mind. Those chains, those chains. Ow, ow kitty. I got I had to click on the link. But who will build the roads? Dominoes, motherfucker. <laughs> you know why? Because pizza pizza, that's why. Damn it. I think they need to get Jimmy John's involved in that too, so they can be crazy fast just as well. There you go, Grim. Okay. Over here in the RLM, which is where you need to be if you want to give me static. Or say hey, or anything else. I know I don't really care for Domino's Pizza. I don't like Papa John's Pizza all that well either. Um, I like my brother David's pizza. <laughs> I've gotten kind of spoiled. And you know, Casey's Pizza isn't too bad. But <clears throat> in any case, over here in the RLM, right up top, I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by Grimner, who is the RLM god, and the voice on multiple sites, multiple, m -m 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 multiple. I also see the lovely Moose Girl is logged in, but I happen to know she went grocery shopping. I did that before I got on the radio, because I had to go in town and help my Uncle Tommy. We're sorting. Oh, my God. We're sorting. <laughs> yeah. Every Wednesday, we do about two to three hours worth of sorting. Because he's he just, you know, he had a hard time trying to get going um, on, on going through Grandpa's stuff. Because he would start, you know, reminiscing. And then he would feel bad because Grandpa thought enough to save this stuff. And then... You know, Uncle Tommy was just going to, um, oh, there you go, Grim. Jimmy Johns can build bridges. All right. But <clears throat> Uncle Tom was having a hard time getting rid of a lot of the wonderful little treasures that Grandpa saved. Grandpa grew up, well, pre-Depression. My mom was born, uh, well, yeah, it was during his formative years. In any case, use it, reuse it, take the working parts and make something else and use it some more. That was Grandpa's motto. And oh my lord, we do this on Wednesdays because they come and dump the dumpster on Thursdays. <laughs> and so that way he doesn't piss off his neighbors. So yeah, we've been filling the dumpsters. And there's been a few times when it's been like, oh my lord, Uncle Tommy, I don't know if that trash truck can pick up that dumpster. Wow. In any case, 
we've been cleaning and sorting. And so I got my grocery shopping before I went to Uncle Tommy's because I really didn't, I didn't get anything that was cold. I'll do that tomorrow. Huh. When I go to Colby where they have real grocery stores and stuff. So, in any case, yeah, where was I at? Hi, Kate. <laughs> I bet you guys really didn't give two shits less about me going, helping Uncle Tommy sort and Grandpa and but I told you anyway, so there. <laughs> Hi, lovely Kate. How's things down in Florida? I also see Asmo. Hey, Asmo. What ca how come he's not Mr. Asmodeus? You are the most Asmodeus Asmo in the whole wide world, even. I also see the lovely Beth Z is here. Hey, Beth. How's things in your world? And BTC Bob. I haven't seen you in a while, sweetie. I know he's a bot, but that's okay. Chalcedony is also here, as well as a double dose of Chloe. Chloe, Chloe. Free Enslaved is in the house. Hey, Free. How's your world? How's your, how's your fur babies doing? I also see I'm here, kind of, sort of, maybe. A little on the warmish side. I think I might have to start undoing some things. <laughs> I have a button-up shirt over my tankini thing, and it's getting warm. In any case, Ibi Don C is here. Hi, Ibi Don C. Da -da 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 -dun, dun, dun, dun. 113 Mexican politicians have been killed. Wow, damn, it's not good to uh, be a Mexican politician, huh? <laughs> Thank you, Kate. I'm glad you do. I I have such a wonderfully interesting family. <laughs> They're goofy. We had a, Uncle Tommy and I had a really good talk about the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and religion utters. And y you know what Rob works? He calls them religion utters too. It's so funny. <laughs> when he said that, I busted a gut laugh and it's like, seriously? I know somebody that says that. <laughs> oh, well. Back to saying, hey, I be Don C. Thank you for sharing that picture earlier, Don. What a cute little fur baby he is. And uh, I don't mind the little wonky ear. That It's like he's got rabbit ears, antennas for ears. It's just too cute. I also see Java, 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 Dr. Two is in the house, as well as JJ's. You Scottish feller. How you doing? Are you wearing your kilt today? It killed me. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I want a taco. <laughs> oh, I don't know what I'm doing for supper yet. Want a taco. That taco sounds good, but I don't have no taco fixings. Damn it. Hey, Rain. How you doing, sweetheart? I need some rain. It came in and did a little bit. Did just enough to make the sidewalk look damp, and then it went, eh, I'm done. Hi, RLM Fluky. She is the Vanna White of the RLM channel, don't you know? Rob Works is here, and Rob fired up that bubbler. Booyah, Rob. Thank you very much. I'm going to need that later. Beetle! Hi, Beetle. How you doing, hon? I know you can't hear because you don't have speakers, but hi, Beetle. You're such a sweetie. Colfax 101 is here, uh, otherwise known as Manson Dubois. <laughs> Oh, I outed him. Damn it. Hi, Dakota. From the great Dakotas. Frumpy is here. Frumpy, Frumpy. Are you? F I'm dressed rather frumpy today because I've been cleaning and sorting. Hi, Ivy Doncy Woik. You double dipping over here. Overtime, overachiever. Kozu is in the house. Hey, Kozu. <laughs> That's true, Rob Works. And, you know, I told Uncle Tommy that um, I said I think it's just absolutely crazy that that someone has to have someone else with an old book that was written thousands of years ago. They have to have that person tell them if they're moral or if they're right or if they're compassionate. And if they are not, how to be moral and right and compassionate and who to associate with and how to dress and how to speak. Because if you don't do it the way that old dusty ass book tells you, then uh, you are immoral. Really? If you ain't got a moral in you, then <clears throat> see ya. 
There's, there's just some crazy, crazy people in this world. Um, oh, that's just gross, Chloe. That Now I don't want tacos. Ew. That's just disgusting. Foy devil. <laughs> Back to saying, hey. Hey, moy, 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 moy. I also see pox box. Hi, pox box and poxified and poxiphone. All three of them got a pox triplet going on. Triple play. Pom -pom, pom sauce is in the house as well as skittle. Skittles. Taste the rainbow. And to round out the crew, the one, the only, the phantom of the RLM. Um, what? Yes, we're getting a McDonald's what? Oh, my Twitter just freaked. Damn it. The picture disappeared. I hate when that happens. Some bitch. It was Kim Jong. And it was something about McDonald's. <laughs> Ooh, did you see that there was something about there was a strain? Oh, I know it was on anti-media because I will go there here in just a little bit. Um, yes, flasher, flasher, flasher. <laughs> okay, let's see. United States doesn't have a federal law banning cannibalism. Idaho is the only state in which the simple act of eating human flesh can land you in prison. Euk. Well, Grimmy, I don't know if it was... A fresh leg, or if it was his last leg. <laughs> okay, it's the last spare one. Mm, God, that was a bad joke. Okay, so I just saw this over on Twitter, and so I clicked on it, and it's like, hey, you know, seeing as how I'm being weird anyway, let's get some really weirdness going on. I'm going to go ahead and close, because, yeah, they keep showing Trump, and that that's just disturbing. Just like when they kept showing Dangleberry. It was really disturbing. I can't... Ew, my eyes are going, stop it! In any case, from worldtruth.tv, strange beams of light are seen all around the world. Now, see, they're on, the, on anti-media, there is an article about um, a strange... Let's see. There it is. Looks like an ascending missile. Objects spotted over Seattle raises questions, which I, I, I may get to that later. But first, but first, let's go with this one. So, most of these beams of, of light shot up from the clouds as if a battery or gigantic searchlight are searching the landscape and are identical to a vertical band of light, like the famous beam of light emanating from the peak of... Uh, Kukulkan Pyramid, photographed by Hector Salazar, July the 24th of 2009, while on vacation in Mexico. Oh, that would have been cool to see. Wow. What's going on? It's them aliens, I tell you. It seems unlikely that these beams are just natural phenomena, camera malfunction, or a digital cam glitch, which that does seem highly unlikely, but... Huh. Could it be that the sun's solar radiation interacts deep within the Earth's magnetic field, adhering to the planet's magnetic lines? And what we see as a beam of light are, in fact, the ionized particles charged from the sun's solar wind. Or is there something going on? Vivander, is there something going on here? Something seems very fishy to me. There are images here um, that are, well, one of them is taken at sunrise during a flight from San Francisco to Phoenix on August 15th of 2015, or August, is that the 15th? No, August 17th. Okay. Um, and at first glance, a beautiful image of the sunrise, but then there's something strange in the image. At first you see the sun emit a streak of light which ends up in a cycle, like a wormhole or a portal. Then below the circle, um, a yellow unknown object, and there is an unknown object that can be seen straight above the sun. Oh? 
There's lots and lots of pictures here. I probably ought to just go ahead and share this for you guys so that you can look at the pictures while I'm reading this because this is really kind of cool. Kind of cool. Oh, not his last leg. It's only a flesh wound. <laughs> Come back, you sissy. It's only a flesh wound. Where's that from? Monty Python. I know. Spoiler alert. My grandkids love that movie, by the way. Okay. Back to this article. The witness stated that he was sitting in the last seat on the aircraft with camera pointed towards the tail away from the wings and that a pilot who had sat beside him also couldn't explain the strange objects as shown in the image. MUFON case 69495, yeah, 495 it has, and there's a link to the image. Now, the unknown object above the sun is a second sun or a UFO that uses the sun as a portal and the yellow object is its scout ship. Is it? The yellow object is not a sun flare or a reflection of the camera as sun flares slash reflections are looking quite different. And there are images to show you the difference. And so is it a coincidence that all of these beams and strange objects near the sun become visible in the same period? And is it that alien races are responsible for the strange lights in the sky? Are they stabilizing the Earth with these beams as Nibiru slash Planet X is closing in? Is it all holographic bullshit trying to get people prepared for aliens that really aren't there? Oh, I just threw that in. Yeah, the largest beams are photographed in Fort Myers, Florida on August 15th at 2015 and Civiticcia, Italy on August 10th of 2015. Huh. And that one was right, the one in Italy was right beside a water spout. Sweet. And there's a video attached to it. There's some really cool, cool, what? Dolphins are... Oh, that's not good. Dad, not good. If you scroll down far enough, you, there's a link to an article, Dolphins Are Dying All Over the World. I don't want that to happen. I like dolphins. Maybe the reason they're dying is because they're getting ready to leave us. So long and thanks for all the fish kind of thing. Never know. Or maybe the leeches that be realize that the dolphins are way smarter than them. And they're just waiting. They're biding their time for the leeches that be to just eliminate this pest of humanity from the planet so the dolphins can feel f safe again. Maybe that's what. Because, yeah, the frickin' Navy uses them to carry bombs and all kind of nasty-ass shit. It's like, God dang. Seriously? Assholes. You want a bomb delivered to someone? Deliver it yourself. Okay, now that I got this shared over on the effin site, effin, let's see, um, dum, dum, where was I at? Okay, I got to click on this dolphins thing. Because that, that, that's really going to make me very sad. Also from WorldTruth.tv, dolphins are mysteriously dying around the world. I wonder how they're ca uh, cataloging this. Apparently, dolphins are mysteriously dying around the world in Cape Cod, the Gulf of Mexico, and Brazil. Since January, dead dolphins have washed ashore in Peru, and the death toll reaching a staggering 877. Holy cripes! Um, scientists are still trying to explain the bizarre deaths, and their best prediction at the moment is that it's due to a virus outbreak or acoustic trauma. Huh. Imagine that. Sound technology being tested out on critters that use sound to navigate and hunt and all kind of, because they will be more receptive, and you can see the results immediately. Assholios. 
That's just one theory I'm going to throw out there, but it would not surprise me one damn bit. Although, it could also be, mm, virus? I don't think so. Maybe it's all that frickin' aluminum nanoparticles and barium and strontium and all that other nasty-ass nanoparticle shit. You guys are geoengineering the climate. Stop it already. Uh, we don't know what kind of adverse effects this might have on human life or any other life on the planet, but we've got to do this in order to save the planet. Fucking morons. There's my F-bomb, if I haven't said one before. It's going to be one of those nights. Apparently, several mass deaths of dolphins have occurred over the past few years, and while experts are worried about the die-off, they say we are not witnessing a global population crash. I hope to God not. But what's behind the recent mass strandings and deaths is complicated and inevitably involves humans. No shit, Sherlock. For example, the bottlenose dolphin in the Gulf of Mexico started in early 2010, even before BP's massive oil spill in April of 2010. Disease was linked to some of the hundreds of Gulf dolphin deaths, but not all of them. The ultimate cause remains mysterious. Once again, dis-ease. What the hell are we doing that's causing them to have dis-ease? Depends on how you pronounce things. Nonetheless, the past two years have been rough for several species of dolphins, but not nearly, or not all the nearly 40 species of dolphins are in hot water. Apparently, there is not a large-scale die-off of dolphins across the globe or throughout ocean basins. This is according to Connie Barclay, who is a spokesperson for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Ans Administration, NOAA. Na it's National Marine Fisheries Service. NOAA is always truthful. Pay no attention to the fact that they have an agenda and are a government entity. Never mind. Yeah, what we do see are localized areas where strandings and deaths have occurred, Barclay said. Scientists have seen unusually high rates of illness and death in specific populations of bottlenose, dolph bottlenose dolphins in the Gulf of Mexico. Also, long-beaked common dolphins along the beaches of Peru and short-beaked common dolphins along the shores of Cape Cod. In other words, what are you assholios doing? Whatever it is, stop it. The Peru mass stranding is the largest ever reported in the Western Hemisphere and the biggest since the mass stranding in Europe during the 90s. Uh, the cause of the dolphin strandings and deaths seems to be varied as well. Unlike the fungus decimating multiple North American bat species, no single reason has been found for the dolphin's dilemma. Hmm, let's see, dolphins are mammals, bats are mammals. What are you guys doing that's killing off the mammals? By the way, humans are mammals. So when these mass deaths occur, whole family groups can be wiped out. The effect of the on the future of the species when whole generations of dolphins are wiped out is a serious concern to dolphin research and conservationists. Uh, you know what? We're wiping out a whole generation as well of oomans with this v vaccine bullshit, especially the uh, Gardasil. Yeah, thanks Merck, Captain Assholios. Other possible accomplices in the dolphin's demise were abnormal weather, toxic algae blooms, parasites, pollution exposure, loss of prey leading to starvation. Well, how could that loss of prey be? Oh, pollution, parasites, hmm. Disorientation due to loud noises from ships and oil exploration and physical injury. Not to mention, probably, Mother Nature is getting a little wonky with the magnetic fields. Some of this, uh, but I think the shit, the shit, definitely belongs on the doorstep of humanity or some of humanity. 
In many cases, the cause of strandings is unknown and difficult to discern, says Barclay. A lot of times, strandings, from what I understand, is because of magnetic ley lines, because a lot of times they follow magnetic ley lines. Just going from what I have read, I am not a specialist. So what isn't in doubt is that human impacts on the ocean are hurting dolphins around the world. Ding, ding, ding. People should recognize that dolphins need the waters to survive, that we are visitors in their homes, said Wells. And as visitors, we should be good stewards and respect the needs of these animals as they try to make a living in the aquatic environment. They are not making a living, you moron. They are living. Stop equating our frickin' psycho babble bullshit on every other animal. Wolves don't have to go out and make a living. Sorry, honey. Gotta go out to work today. Uh, dolphins don't do it. Penguins don't do it. They don't do the stupid shit we do. We were the only ones stupid enough to fall for that crap. Oh, you want to live? Well, you're going to have to go out and make one. Really? Hmm. Everyday choices can affect the fate of dolphins. Dolphin experts had some suggestions on how to lead a dolphin-friendly life. So, no matter where you live, reducing pollution can help these animals, as chemicals such as PCBs can be transported by air for thousands of miles before being deposited into marine environments, as well as the lovely shit they're putting in the atmosphere that's raining down everywhere. Wells also warned against the illegal but popular practice of feeding wild dolphins. The practice brings dolphins closer to the dangers of being struck by boats or tangled in fishing lines and disrupts the animals' social groups. In other words, please don't feed the animals. They might become dependent and will no longer be able to survive on their own. You, we've been doing that to our own species for a long time, and you see how that's working out. Since January, dead dolphins have washed ashore in Peru, and the death toll reaching a staggering 877 so far. Scientists are still trying to explain the bizarre deaths, and their best prediction at the moment is that it's due to a virus outbreak or acoustic trauma. Acoustic trauma. Hmm. I'm thinking submarines, naval vessels, that kind of stuff. That would be rather traumatic. Y'all are dicking around with shit out there far away, but it's f maybe far away from human observation, but not from the critters that live in the ocean. Environmental authorities are investigating the deaths of more than 800 dolphins that have washed up in the northern coast of Peru this year. Now, they may have died from an outbreak of morbillivirus or brucella bacteria, said the per Peruvian Deputy Environmental Minister Gabriel, Gabriel, I'm not butchering that last name. And according to Peru's state-run um, India News Agency, now speaking to CNN, oh, well, that makes it factual. He said he expects test results to be ready within the week. Mm -hmm. Right now, the most probable hypothesis is that it's a virus outbreak. But he did say Thursday that 877, okay, how many times are you going to repeat that in this article? Seriously. More than 80% of these dolphins were found in an advanced state of decomposition, making it difficult to study their deaths, according to... Andina. Now, earlier this week, the Peruvian government put together a panel from different ministries to analyze a report by the Peruvian Sea Institute. Oh, great. The Peruvian government put together a panel. In other words, they formed a committee. I guess we all know that we're not going to know anything about what could have possibly caused any of this stuff for at least another 10, 15 years, because anytime you get a panel or a committee involved, there goes the timeline. Hmm. 
they have been saying they have concluded that the dolphin's deaths were not due to lack of food, interaction with fisheries, poisoning with pesticides, biotoxin poisoning, or contamination by heavy metals. <laughs> yeah, are you sure about that? But when we have something this large, my gut tells me that there's something traumatic that happened. Yes, that was from Sue Rolka, who is a marine biologist with the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Society. And she told that to CNN as well. Why does everybody talk to CNN? Really? Mm. She floated a number of possibilities as to what could have killed the animals, including acoustic trauma, but concluded that investigators just don't know yet. More investigation needs to be done. Obviously, more investigation needs to be done, but... <sighs> they have a committee now and a panel. Also, February, 179 dolphins, 108 of which were dead, washed ashore at Cape Cod in the eastern United States. And in early March, an amateur video took uh, taken from the beach in Rio de, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil showed more than 30 dolphins on shore. So, this does go on for quite some time. So, I'm going to let you guys finish reading this. Because it's, to me, it's looking like it's repetitive, repetitive. I know, they're always trying to blame heavy metal for some kind of evil, but Grimmy, it's a completely different kind of heavy metal. And I think there is a reason why they do that, so that you will think that heavy metal is bad juju. Now, I have listened to some heavy metal that I thought was bad juju, and I just don't listen to those groups anymore. I can't even tell you who in hell it was now. Bad, because I don't listen to them. <laughs> But there's some heavy metal that I do enjoy as well. So, okay, let me put this over here on the effing side if I can find it. I have way too many tabs open. What the hell? This is just really sad. I like dolphins. I think they're way cool, and I think we need to leave them alone. Okay. Now, don't shoot the messenger. Okay. Don't be calling me Hansel. <laughs> but from foxnews.com. <laughs> See, even I check out Fox News. <clears throat> California's university website says it's okay for children to engage in sexual play and watch porn. No, really. These, this comes to you from higher levels of educraption. A public university in California features a controversial website that encourages parents to react positively when four-year-olds touch each other's genitals and says young children should be allowed to watch porn. Okay. <laughs> really? The University of California, Santa Barbara, hosts an online platform with a sociology department called Sex Info Online, which is maintained by students who have studied advanced topics in human sexuality. In other words, they've gone to lots of bars and gotten laid with lots of people. Oh, was that rather derogatory? I think so. Oh, and they seek to answer a myriad of questions on sexuality. The College Fix reported that. Apparently, the majority of sexual play between children takes place between the ages of four and seven, the website states in a section titled Childhood Sexuality, accompanied by a photo of two little girls that appear to be kissing on a beach. Okay, just because little ones are kissing doesn't mean that it's sexual. That's number one. Little ones do that. Little ones just go up and they 
give each other kisses. They also smack each other upside the head. They also pinch each other. They also pull each other's hair. Not all of that is sexual. Not, none of it is sexual. Only you are reading that into it, you moron. Yes. I think it does make it kitty porn, Grim. I think it does. Oh, what's that? Uh, ooh, okay. Back to this. So, um, okay, childhood sexuality. And it's accompanied by, okay, yada, 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 yada. Now, children might display affection to their friends by hugging and kissing or touching each other's genitals, which is perfectly normal. Most little ones do not go around touching each other's genitals. Now, now that I've said that, I will say that siblings have a tendency, especially with younger siblings, to go, especially if they are of a different gender. I, I had younger siblings that would go, what's that? You know, I have grandchildren that basically did the same thing. Children are curious. That doesn't mean it's sexual. Now, parents should not react in a negative way because children are just exploring. Yes, children are just exploring. Children are curious. But let's don't be morons about this, okay? It also adds that parents should intervene only if the acts are non-consensual or hurtful. <sighs> wow. Okay. <laughs> In the section titled, Talking to Your Children About Sex, parents are encouraged to let their children watch pornography. <coughs> wow. Seriously. It's important that children understand that viewing pornography is a normal habit and that they should not need to be ashamed of it. UCSB, yeah, it should be UCBS students wrote that. And I'm sorry, I think y'all know pretty much my stand on pornography. I don't need to watch that shit to, number one, get ideas. Number two, I have a very fertile imagination. Number three, um, it's like, why watch someone else getting some if you ain't getting some? That's just... And besides the fact that it's a very exploitative process, not just for the females, but also for the males. Yeah, most men are going, yeah, baby, anything. But the porn industry is not a pretty industry. And all they're doing is going for the quick fix. That little ha-ha moment. You know, and to get you drawn into it. And to get you to cheapen your values. So me, no. Porno what, viewing pornography is not a normal habit. But they are trying to make it so. If you watch porn, that is your business. But don't be, mm, ah, don't be doing this shit to kids. Freaking sick pervies. Apparently, parents were angered um, after Planned Parenthood partner leads graphic sex ed lesson in science class. The article tells parents how to have the talk with their kids. Children and teens do not want to be told what to do, especially when it comes to personal topics such as sex, the website states. It is important that parents do not lecture their children, but instead try to present information and have an open discussion about sex. Adolescents will make their own decisions regarding sex, and it is up to the parents to give them the information and resources needed to make informed decisions. It is up to the parents to answer questions with just as much information as will what will satisfy the curiosity at the moment at that age level. Period. Period. When children are ready, they will ask more detailed questions. Speaking as a parent who has been through this with two daughters and had some of those questions to field with grandchildren as well. Apparently, the school's Department of Psychology or Sociology 
chair declined to comment and the university did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Well, have your little ones watch porn. Really? Only in California. Good God. <sighs> I think they just need to... I think my mother was right. My mother was right. Mother said that they need to do like five nukes along the San Andreas fault line <laughs> and just watch it go off into the ocean. Sadly, the winds will blow inward, but eh, it'll get Nevada. <laughs> Been there, done that, not all that impressed. Might nail Arizona. Mm, not real impressed with Arizona either. Some parts are cool, but most are hot. Um, yeah, no. California just needs to fall off into the ocean. Freaking crazy ass people out there. Okay, get this over here on the effing site real quick. Uh, talk about the devil. Okay. Let's see, where do I want to go first? Um. Mm -hmm -hmm. How about... I go to antimedia.com. 12 tips to understanding the world and why it is the way it is. By the way, <clears throat> it is working just as designed. So, this is from Caitlin Johnstone. She, it's from today, and it is her opinion. In an environment that is saturated with mass media propaganda, it can be hard to figure out which way is up, let alone get an accurate read on what's going on in the world. Actually, it's hard to figure out which way is up if you're one of those people that you have to have someone else tell you if what's going on is right or wrong. If you have that inner compass, you really don't need someone else telling you, well, wait a minute, I know you think that that's wrong, but really, it's right. It's for the greater good. No, it's not. So, <clears throat> here are a few tips that I've learned which have given me a lot of clarity in seeing through the haze of spin and confusion. Take it s taken separately, they don't tell you a lot. But taken together, they paint a very useful picture of the world and why it is the way it is. Number one, it's always ultimately about acquiring power. Yeah. So in the quest to understand why governments move in such irrational ways, why expensive, senseless wars are fought while homeless people die of exposure on the streets, why mil millionaires and billionaires get richer and richer while everyone else struggles to pay the rent, why we destroy the ecosystem that we depend on for survival. Why one elected official tends to advance more or less the same harmful policies and agendas as his or her predecessor. People, not, people often come up with explanations which don't really hold water. Now the most common of these is probably the notion that all of these problems are due to the malignant influence of one or two mainstream political parties. And if the other party could just get in control of the situation, all of the problems would just go away. Now other explanations include the belief that humans are just intrinsically awful, blaming minorities like Jews or immigrants, blaming racism and white supremacy, or going all the way down wild and twisted rabbit holes into theories about reptilian secret societies and baby-eating pedophile cabals. The, I don't doubt those. Rep, by the way, the reptilian secret society, that's because they're ba working 
letting their reptilian mind control them. My beliefs, not necessarily what's actually going on, but the reptilian brain is the base brain. That's the fight or flight reaction. That's the one that is always paranoid. Always. And always out to save their own ass. That's the reptilian brain. Now, she goes on to say, Re really, it's all of mankind's irrational behavior can be explained by the basic human impulse to amass power and influence over one's fellow humans, combined with the fact that sociopaths tend to rise to positions of power. Basically, they're floaters. You can flush and flush and flush, but until you go and get a five-gallon bucket full of water and flush and dump that bucket at the same time, you ain't going to get those floaters go down the damn sewer. Just saying. So, our evolutionary ancestors were pack animals, and the ability to rise in social standing in one's pack determined crucial matters like whether one's uh, got first or last dibs on food or got to reproduce. Now, this impulse to rise in our pack is hardwired deeply into our evolutionary heritage. But when left unchecked due to a lack of empathy, and when expanded into the globe spanning 7.6 billion human pack we now find ourselves in, due to ease of transportation and communication, it can lead to individuals who keep amassing more and more power until they wield immense influence over entire clusters of nations. And as something that Uncle Tommy and I were discussing, we had some really good discussions today. The only reason those people are in power is because they have enough little peons wandering around believing that they should be in power because, well, then they will make those decisions for me so I don't have to, which basically breaks down to do not wish to take personal responsibility for anything, including their own lives. That's what got us into this predicament. Too many people would much rather... Oh, I'll just abdicate my personal responsibility and any kind of rights and privileges that go along with it so that that guy will be responsible for me and I don't have to worry about it. Idiots. Number two, money rewards soci uh, sociopathy. It, yeah, it does. Floaters. The willingness to do anything to get ahead, to claw your way to the top, to betray whomever you need to, to throw anyone under the bus, to step on anyone, to pass them in the rat race. By the way, they are rats, and they're racing. Step back. Let them run each other over. It will be rewarded in our current system. Being willing to underpay employees, cheat the legal system, and influence legislators will be rewarded exponentially more. People with a sense of empathy are often unwilling to do such things, whereas sociopaths and psychopaths are. About 4% of the population are sociopaths, and about 1% are psychopaths, with some 5 to 15% falling somewhere along the borderline. The less empathy you have, the further you are willing to go, and the further up the ladder you can climb. But that's only if people allow it, if everyone else allows this to happen, well, you know, he's, he's, what? Well, no, no. He shits just like the rest of us. He's ooman. Don't put up with that shit. Number three, wealth kills empathy. I don't know about that. I know some people that are very well-to-do, that are very, very empathic, very, very considerate, and they work their asses off to get where they're at. But as a whole, I can see where this stereotype would fit. So if it weren't bad enough, studies have shown that controlling large amounts of money or large amounts of wealth actually destroys one's sense of compassion for one's fellow man. When you're able to use wealth to obtain everything from security to loyalty to personal relationships, 
you no longer have to be turned in to the brain or tuned into the brain's empathy center the rest of humanity depends on to get an accurate reading on what's going on with people we're surrounded by and see to me that shows the lack of morality and lack of honor and and lack of self-worth of those that you surround yourself with if you can buy people like that buy their loyalty buy yourself into relationships man them other people must not think very well of themselves that's just my thoughts most people need to be constantly feeling around for families co-workers employers employ uh, friends and acquaintances in order to ensure their own safety social standing and security and well wealthy people can simply purchase those things once again wow talk about low people both the payers and the takers being born into wealth or having it for a long time can prevent the sense of empathy from being as strong as it is for the rest of the population and see that I think is is a blanket statement that I don't know ne is necessarily applicable just because of some of the people that I have known throughout my life just saying number four money is power only see and and it keeps coming back to me that get rid of the damn monetary system just just get rid of it make a living earn a living jeez a 2014 Princeton study showed that ordinary Americans have essentially zero influence over their nation's policy and behavior regardless of how they vote ding 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 while wealthy Americans have a great deal of influence why because they can afford lobbyists this is because of oh hey guess what that's what it is this is because of the ability to use corporate lobbying and campaign donations effectively amounts to legalized bribery of elected officials yeah see if they do it it's it's lobbying if you do it it's bribery they get a promotion you get to go to the gray bar Hilton <clears throat> so this creates a ruling class which is naturally incentivized to use their influence to increase their own wealth while decreasing everyone else's because since power is relative the less money everyone else has the more power the ruling class has only if you decide that you no longer need their bullshit so this is why billionaires keep hoarding more and more wealth while using legalized bribery to stifle economic justice legislation legislation is not you cannot legislate morality hun sorry it isn't because they want to be able to buy luxury thousands of luxury cars or dozens of private jets they can only use one at a time the same as everyone else they hoard re uh, wealth to keep the rest of the population from having it mine 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 it's that whole green m m syndrome because money equals power and spreading wealth around would be tantamount to making everyone king and because power is relative making everyone king would mean that no one is king oh but everyone can be king of their own castle hun and by the way you know when you spread the wealth out like that um, there are going to be people that are going to just plain lose it because because they're just not all that sharp or don't have a lick of common sense or whatever and then they're going to be asking someone please sir slave I remain please sir may I have more and that's how you get it because eventually someone else sees hey they don't have to work for theirs and they're getting some I can do that shit too yeah humanity has some l less tasteful qualities to it number five this same ruling class controls the media mm-hmm cute little trumple stillskin there by the way it's common knowledge that most media is controlled by plutocrats um, whether it's old money 
uh, they control the legacy media or the new money Silicon Valley plutocrats who control much of the new media. Media control is an essential component of rule. Uh huh. Control the information, you control the people. This has always been the case since the days when kings would order dis uh, dissident books burned and bishops would torture dissident orators to death. Religion utters and egomaniacs. This is why the first thing a new plutocrat does as soon as rising to a certain level of wealth is to start buying up media influence like Jeff Bezos did when he bought the Washington Post. He bought WAPO not because he's a stupid businessman who thought newspapers were about to make a lucrative resurgence but because he is a brilliant businessman who knows that the status quo he is building his empire upon requires a propaganda firm that the public will trust and believe. Believe, I tell you. Number six, people are always manipulating each other. Uh-huh. That's because people like to fib a bit. Cultivating an acute aware awareness of when you are being manipulated and considering whether someone m might have a motive to do so is an essential component to making sense of the world. It's very rare to encounter someone who won't try to manipulate you in any way. Generally, people you'll encounter in your life will try to influence the way you perceive them and your relationship to them. And they'll try to pull you in some ways and push you in others. Try to hook you up to their personal agendas and goals and shape you in a way that fits their shape. There's nothing inherently malevolent about this. It's just that what people do and what they always have done. Again, humans are social creatures and we do what we can to increase our social standing within our social circles. The big problem is when skillful manipulators find their way into positions of large-scale influence like government or media. Unfortunately, these are the types who tend to elevate to such positions, floaters, because they can manipulate their way in. And generally, they do so for reasons of personal ambition rather than altruism. Okay, seriously, most people do things for personal ambition. You know, most people have a very personal vested interest in, in their actions. Altruism figures in with a lot of people as well, but base is personal. These skillful manipulators form an essential echelon of the ruling class's loyal servants and are the minds behind the pro-establishment narratives you'll suddenly see circulated from think tanks to media platforms to the essential lackeys on Capitol Hill. Yes, people are very social critters. <sighs> but the bullshit meter has been broken in most of them. And I think fluoridation of the water has an awful lot to do with that. It's been going on for how many decades now? Number seven, society is made of narrative. He who controls the narrative controls the world. Yep. Most of human experiences is filtered through our mental stories about it, from our sense of self to our ideas about who we are, to our beliefs about who we're or how we're supposed to behave in society, to what money is and how it works, to where power exists and who we're supposed to obey. All of these things are purely conceptual constructs which only exist in the realm of thought. A dollar exists to the extent that we've all agreed to pretend it's a real thing and that it has a certain amount of purchasing power. At any time, we could collectively decide to change the rules about how much power functions or what money is and how it operates. And then instantly, the rule of the elite class would be over 
without anyone firing a shot. It really would be that simple, and yeah, it would. But you gotta have enough people to say, okay, I'm done. This is bullshit. Seriously, this is bullshit. That's how powerful a force of nature is, which is why the ruling plutocrats fight so hard to keep us from seizing control of it. This is why whistleblowers and outlets like WikiLeaks are aggressively and constantly smeared and demonized in the corporate media. And if they can create suspicion of truth tellers, then they can keep them from being trusted and thus, and thus keep them from being believed. This tool has been used to minimize the impact of everything from on the ground reports of what's happening in Syria to leak drops from Edward Snowden, who I still don't trust. And if you can create enough suspicion of someone, it doesn't matter if they're speaking 100% truth. Nobody will believe them. And thus, the dominant narrative will remain the same. Maintaining an awareness that there is always an unending battle of control the narrative and to manipulate, um, manipulate it to advance plutocratic interests is an essential part of understanding the world. And yeah, if you can't baffle them in, with diamonds, or if you can't dazzle them with diamonds, baffle them with bullshit. People need to get that BS detector tuned up. Number eight, the lines between nations are imaginary. Uh-huh. I uh, listened to a, a Joseph Campbell thing on um, something about myths. It's like a seven-part series on Netflix. Yeah, there are no lines out there anywhere. You cannot see any lines. The states are not different colored like they are on maps. None of that other shit. It's all bullshit. That's pure narrative. And they're only as real as the collective public agrees to pretend they are. The ruling elites know this and exploit it. They don't think in terms of nations and governments. They think in terms of individuals and groups of individuals. Key strategic region in the Middle East? Well, no need to take over the whole country. Just flood it with extremist groups who are loyal to your agendas and control its oil fields. Primo naval real estate in the Southern Hemisphere? Well, no need to annex it and plant your country's flag there. Just secure enough influence over the important moving parts using corporate contracts, trade agreements, military intelligence treaties, and secret deals that you can use for however you want. This is why I, dis I am dismissive of arguments that Israel controls America or America controls Europe. There is no Israel or America. They are made up ideas which rulers once upon a time treated as real. But in the modern days of nationless plut plutocracy, <coughs> they no longer do. There are individuals, there are corporations, there are government agencies, there are factions and groups, and these are what the ruling elites deal with. Governmental structures are only tools which are used by the ruling elites for the purpose of manipulation, control, and military violence. Read that as terrorism. And they only do so insofar as it's useful. The idea of real nations and governments is a cutesy fairy tale sold to the masses so they won't see the manipulations. Look behind the curtain, hun. <coughs> that guy's a shyster. Number nine. Powerful forces. Oh, excuse me. Wow. Powerful so forces are naturally incentivized to collaborate with each other toward mutual interests. Mm -hmm. So, you can be a low-grade millionaire and still live like a relatively normal civilian. 
But once you start ob obtaining giant amounts of wealth uh, or wealth control, you need to start collaborating with existing power structures or they'll snuff you out to prevent you from rocking their boat. Because again, money equals power. This is why Jeff Bezos contracts with the CIA and cites on the Pentagon Advisory Board. And it's why Facebook and Google collaborated extensively with government agencies. They never would have been allowed to grow to their size if they had not. Plutocratic dynasties, which have been in place since long before Amazon or Facebook or Google, figured this out many generations ago and have agreed to push forward in a direction of mutual interest. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I'll try not to draw too much blood. This is extremely true in the West, where an effective empire has been created by a complex transnational alliance of mostly Western plutocrats, but it is true outside of that empire as well. There are power alliances to be found everywhere that there is power. Number 10. There is an immense amount of wealth that can be grabbed in the chaos of war and conflict. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. In the same way that existing power structures are naturally incentivized to quash any emerging power which would upset their status quo, Alliances of power structures push to crush non-aligned power structures the world over. Whenever you see the tight Western alliances and their media propaganda arms attacking the interests of, oh, let's see, Russia or China or Syria or Iran or Venezuela or whoever, you are seeing an alliance of power structures working to disrupt the interests of another alliance of power structures in order to absorb their assets. The chaotic Wild West environments of these conflicts create, they allow for an amount of underhanded looting and pillaging that you could never get away with in your own country in the exact same way that the colonialists and the conquistadors of old could never have gotten away with brazenly grabbing gold, land, and slaves from their fellow Europeans in Madrid or Rome, but were given no legal trouble in the New World. The colonialists and conquistadors pushed into the Americas, Africa, and Asia on the pretense of spreading Christianity and civilization. Modern-day conquerors push into non-aligned power structures on the pretense of spreading freedom and democracy in precisely the same way. This chaos doesn't require direct military conflict to be profitable. The uncritical enmity against Russia that the Western Plut uh, Plutocratic Alliance has manufactured with its media control has allowed them to be blamed for everything, from incriminating WikiLeak documents to a corporate raid by Ukrainian oligarchs, without any questions asked. Anyone who has ever had to deal personally with a sociopath knows how much they love to exploit the gray areas of chaotic situations they given them. What is that? Never let a good crisis go to waste. And geopolitical conflicts create those situations in spades. Number 11. The neocons are always wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. This one's really easy. If you ever want to be on the right side of history for a foreign policy debate, look at what Bish, Bish, <laughs> Bush era PNAC neocons like John Bolton and Bill Crystal are saying about it. Talk about opposite positions. Neocon thought leaders have been loudly and catastrophically wrong about everything since the turn of the century. 
from Afghanistan to Iraq to Libya to Syria. And they're not about to start being right now. And finally, number 12, the push towards truth always starts with yourself. You can't out-manipulate seasoned manipulators. The main error most people make when trying to deal with a sociopath is to try to manipulate them back. Don't even try. You know it's like arguing with an idiot. Stop. You'll lose. And you'll become an idiot as well. He will win because he's been doing it for a while. And he's good at it. Um, they have years of experience on you because they literally have done nothing else. While you were laughing and crying and worrying and connecting and relating to people, they were working out how to play humans like Gary Kasparov worked out to play how to play chess. And when you have literal teams of sociopaths collaborating together to amass power, you, my dear child, do not have a chance. So just don't play their game. You will lose. The only way to win this is to set your compass resolutely on true. Always be honest with yourself. Find all the different ways that you're manipulating others and see them and acknowledge them. Find your tribal allegiances and your desire to be right and tip your hat to their existence. The more self-aware we are, the less levers we have to be manipulated by. If you are blindly partisan or loyal to a or particular fraction, or faction, I should say, bang, that makes you gullible to propaganda because your wishful thinking and your desire to be right come into play. So get honest with yourself about who you are and what you want, and you will start to become an unplayable piece on the board. If we can't beat these bastards with truth, we don't deserve to win. Well, Caitlin Johnstone, for the most part, I agree with you. There's a few things there that, eh, but for the most part, yeah. Grimmy just killed a duck. Grimmy! Oh, uh, you know, he probably doesn't have a birth certificate because birth certificates for us peons. That's in reference to something Free and Slave said in the chat. Okay, let me put this over here. On, uh, and you know what? I was caught up in that whole birth certificate shit too. God, I can still remember arguing like crazy. But he doesn't. He's not showing his birth certificate. What if he doesn't have one because he's not supposed to have one because he's one of those direct descendant kind of things and they don't have to have birth certificates? What if? Hmm... That's kind of what I'm thinking. Okay. Let's see. Now, since I read that one, this is one that I found over on Twitter. It's from yourvoiceamerica.tv. And it's a freaking video. See, I didn't scroll down far enough. Damn it! It's, um, media goes on a hate spree. As predicted, the media, never Trump and Democrats, or never Trump and Democrats, have been on a 48-hour hate fest about Trump's North Korea deal. Also, great news for MAGA in primaries. Oh, wow. See, this is what I get for not actually scrolling down. I clicked the link and I went, okay, I'll get to that. It's a freaking video. I will share it for you so you can check it out. But, yeah. And it's from today. And I'm sure they're going on a hate spree. Hell, there's a haters going to hate. Killing ducks is your job, Grimmy. Do you eat any of them? Okay. 
there was one other I really, really, really wanted to get to, and now I'm somewhat concerned, because it might be something stupid like that one as well. Okay, maybe I stuck it in my pocket. Ah, here we go, here we go. This is one that I believe Grimmy shared earlier about dominoes. <laughs> okay, from the freethoughtproject.com. But who will build the roads? Domino's launches an initiative to fix America's potholes. If they do a committee, I swear to God, I'm going to drop kick them. Oh, well. So, while the question of who will build the roads is typically presented as a problem that only government can solve, Domino's Pizza is now responding by launching a campaign to fix potholes on roads across the country. Domino's is encouraging customers to nominate their towns for pothole repairs at pavingforpizza.com. So far, there are already four different cities that have benefited from road repairs, including Bartonville, Texas, Milford, Delaware, Athens, Georgia, and Burbank, California. Russell Weiner, who is president of Domino's USA, joked in a press release that this idea was to help pizza get to their destination safely, which, eh. Nobody wants the pizza delivery guy trying to get it there, pizza, pizza, super fast, 20 minutes or less, hitting a pothole, your pizza getting flipped upside down, you gotta scrape all the toppings off of the box now. It's just ruined. Nobody wants that shit. So, have you ever hit a pothole and instantly cringed? Uh-huh. There's a lot of dips in the road, too, that, yeah, take out the whole undercarriage. <clears throat> so, we know the feeling is heightened when you're bringing home a carry-out order from your local Domino's store. And we don't want to lose any great-tasting pizza to a pothole, ruining a wonderful meal. Okay, if you, if you think so. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the portion uh, on the website for the campaign says, Potholes, cracks, and bumps in the road can cause irreversible damage to your pizza during the drive home from Domino's. Why isn't Domino's delivering? That's what I want to know. We can't stand by and let your cheese slide to one side. Your toppings get untopped or your boxes get flipped. So we're helping to pave in towns across the country to save your good pizza from these bad roads. Bad road, bad juju, bad road. Now, Eric Norenberg, who is city manager of Milf Milford, Delaware, welcomed the help in dealing with the repairs. Facing an already harsher winter than usual for Delaware, this is an opportunity to get additional money to stretch our city's limited resources, he said. When was this dated? It's dated today. So, um, da -da 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 -da. where was I at? There I am. In other words, a politician was happy to hold on to as much of his constituents' money as he possibly could. Yeah. And what are you going to do with those funds now that you're not spending them where they were allocated to go? I know a little something about uh, city budgeting. How you going to do that one, huh? The job that Domino's did in Milford was hi um, highly more efficient than most government operations as it took a crew of just four members to fix 40 potholes in 10 roads in 10 hours. Well, that's because you didn't have three people leaning on shovels telling the one person that was doing the work you're doing it wrong. Despite the fact that many people believe roads would cease to exist if they were not funded by the government, Private charities and businesses have actually been able to serve this function in isolated circumstances when they had the freedom to do so. A perfect example of this very situation was in the news a few years ago on Hawaii's Kauai Island. When the private citizens performed a $4 million road job or road repair job for free in just eight days. 
When a need arises in a community, people naturally come together and take care of what needs to be done. They don't need someone forcing them to do it. It's called for the benefit of all. And it is also a selfish thing because, hey, you aren't going to go out there and fix that road if you ain't going to benefit from it. A lot of people don't realize that, yes, not only is it selfless, it's also selfish. It is a self-interest kind of thing that is community-minded as well. We shouldn't have to do this, but when it gets to a state level, it just gets so bureaucratic. Something that took us eight days would have taken them years, said Troy Martin of Martin Steel, who donated machinery and steel for the repairs. So we got together, the community, and we got it done. More recently, in one uh, Michigan community, people took those, these matters into their own hands instead of sitting around and waiting for the failed government to do it. 2015 residents of Hamtramck, Hamtramck, Michigan, which is a community in the heart of Detroit, started an effort to fill in potholes and repair roads themselves. Critics of taxation are often asked, who will build the roads? Well, apparently there are those who believe that in the absence of the state, humanity will suddenly become incapable of laying down a dirt path or connecting roads to an interstate highway. These people discuss the creation of government roads as if the construction was simply due to the kindness of government and not made possible by the theft of taxation. However, what the government really does is collect money from private citizens under the threat of violence, then use that money to employ those very same citizens to build infrastructure. The reality is that the people could build infrastructure themselves for less money if they coordinated with neighbors and other communities. So spread the love, peeps. And yeah, who will build my roads? I will. There's a lot of people out here in the boonies, you know, those of us rednecks or whatever you want to call them, that uh, that's kind of what we do because the county ain't got the money for it anymore because, well, the county employees need a raise and they need better benefits and they need this and they need that. And I, I understand they want to be able to feed their families. I get that. But y'all have squandered money like crazy. So we do this shit ourselves. I'd just as soon not pay any of it. Okay. Now, from the trenches. I don't remember who shared this one earlier. I believe it was, I think it was probably Rob Works over in the RLM chat. I think so. From the trenches, yeah, from the trenches, worldreport.com. A retired judge sues in attempt to secure a $90,000 pension. Yeah, it was because he and Don were talking. So, in Concord, a retired judge who was found having helped her husband hide money from the state is suing to try and get 400000 in back retirement pay, health care, and a permanent pension of nearly $90,000 a year. Patricia Coffey stepped down in 2008 after the Supreme Court suspended her for three years without pay for helping her husband, ex-state representative John Coffey, to create a trust to hide assets while he was being disbarred for stealing money from an elderly rye woman. Now, the Board of Trustees of the New Hampshire Judicial Retirement Plan voted to deny her application for a pension in 2015. Hmm. Coffee, now 64, lives in California and maintains she's entitled to a pension equal to 70% of her highest average salary for having served the judicial bench for more than 16 years. She said the retirement law grants that pension to anyone who serves at least 15 years once they reach age 60. 
but the trustees said the law required Coffey to remain in the employment as a judge until she reached 60. Once she voluntarily stepped down, she forfeited those pension rights. The board's denial was incorrect, both as a matter of law and under the terms of the plan Coffey maintained in her lawsuit. Coffey's lawyer, Russell Hilliard, is representing her. And lawyers representing the judicial plan trustees now have 30 days to respond to this suit brought in the U.S. District Court. So, I did something wrong. And instead of being fired and possibly having criminal charges filed against me, I decided to go quietly and step down. But now that I'm in the latter years and living in California where it's really, really expensive to live, I'd like to have that money, so I'm going to sue your sorry ass. That's pretty much the way that's working out. Why should that woman get to reap rewards of her own crooked behavior? I don't think so. That's having your cake, eating it too, and then also shitting on everybody's plate after it's gone through the digestive process. No. 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 Don't think so, toots. So, we'll just do that one. I don't know that I need to. Do I need to uh, do that one again? Over here. Sorry, something went wrong. Uh, Skittles? What the heck? What are you doing to that chair? Damn it. What that chair ever do to you? I'll put this over here again anyway. Okay, and I think I had one more in my pocket I wanted to get to before I go to, um, ouch, before I go check out the pig. I do want to check out the pig. Now, this is from madinamerica.com, and it is from April of 2016. Ouch. So... MadInAmerica.com, psychiatric diagnosis is a fraud. The destructive and damaging fiction of biological diseases. This is by Robert Berezin, MD. Life is pain, princess. Anyone who tells you different is selling you something. That's from Dread Pirate Roberts and the Princess Bride, which I absolutely loved that movie. I really do. That It's just, just a fun, fun movie. In any case, <clears throat> everywhere you turn, you see OCD, ASD, MDD, ADD, ADHD, BPD, GAD, PD, SAD, PTSD, NPD, etc., etc., etc. The problem is not limited to this acronym SOUP, but the pseudo-diagnosis they represent. Patients today get stained by the specious medical diagnosis of biological psychiatry. And furthermore, they are brainwashed to believe that these fictitious brain diseases are genetic. Biological psychiatry treats people like they are a mechanical object, renaming them almost as they are rebranding products. The one I like best is the renaming of manic depressive to bipolar. Instead of a name which accurately describes the state of suffering, it was turned into something mechanical, a battery with two poles. We've gone from something human to something Frankensteinian. But fear not, we have psychoactive drugs that will correct the imbalance in your genetically damaged brain. We have antidepressants for your depression, benzodiazepines for your anxiety, amphetamines for your ADHD, antipsychotics for your schizophrenia, antidepressants for your OCD, etc., etc., etc. 
Sadly, I have heard many stories from patients that began when they received their diagnosis. They were told they have a disease and it's not your fault, they're told. It's genetic. For the lucky few, it may only take a few years to recover from their biological diagnosis is bogus. Then to find their way to good therapy and or continue on their journey. We are sold a bill of goods where it's believed that taking drugs could possibly attend to the incredible complexity of human suffering. How did it happen that within a generation such a delusion captured the public imagination and currently holds sway? Well, part of that is they allowed them to start advertising on TV on the boob tube. Young people have said to me, you're a psychiatrist and you do, uh, do psychotherapy, right? Well, I've never heard of that. Initially, I was shocked. Now I get letters all the time from people who ask me if I know any psychiatrists in their town who don't give drugs. So, <clears throat> there have always been two competing currents in psychiatry. Psychodynamic, which is fundamentally psychoanalytic, and psychotherapy, or psychodynamic psychotherapy versus semantic psychiatry. Hmm. Now, there's only one, and for the full story of somatic psychiatry, see, do not or do no harm the destructive history of pharmaceutical psychiatry and its bedfellows, electroshock, insulin shock, and lobotomies. Oh joy, oh bliss. This gives the true story of so, uh, somic psychiatry. And its practice has been an act to act directly on our brains, shocking them, reaming them out with ice picks, and now reaming them out chemically. It has always done great harm, but its sordid history has gotten lost in the amnesia of time. But make no mistake, pharmaceutical psychiatry is the current incarnation of som som somatic psychiatry, and we are doing harm all over again. So regarding the psychoanalytic there have been very many good therapists, illuminating writers like Fairbairn and Wincott and Harry Stack Sullivan, as well as important understandings about attachment. And there are many excellent teachers. And don't get me wrong, there are plenty of problems due to faulty psychoanalytic theories, which interfere with responsiveness to our patients. Nevertheless, I'm suggesting a new paradigm in the psychotherapy tradition, the psychotherapy of character. It's a specialized form of human engagement that repairs the damage to one's personality by acting on the play of consciousness in the very way that it formed in the brain in the first place. It's an art and a science that bridges the old divide between psychotherapy and the brain. To put it simply, <clears throat> human struggle is purely a human problem. It's derived from the consequences of deprivation and abuse in our formative years, followed by additional struggles that result from our adaptations to the ongoing traumas of life. Psychotherapy promotes the recovery of a person's authentic being through genuine and trusted engagement with the therapist. Mourning the pain of this interplay heals our symptoms and our suffering. Now, the specious enterprise of healing brain diseases is based on a faulty understanding of neuroscience and the brain. The biological orientation has mistaken parts of the brain for the whole. Separate elements of the brain operate mechanically and are not the cause of psychiatric symptoms. The parts all work in concert to create the play of consciousness. 
The truth is that memories of trauma stored throughout the limbic system, the amygdala, and the hippocampus are the seat of our suffering and symptoms. The visible replay of the scenes in, a, in the play generate our symptoms, and our genetic temperament gives form to the symptoms. Phobias in a person or obsessions in another. And when the trauma is mourned, as when watching a tragic play, we undergo a catharsis. We sit with the pain and the brain changes all on its own. Psychiatry has always been a, sport step, a poor stepchild of medicine. In doctorly circles, it was demeaned and disrespected. And the somatic psychiatrists wished to achieve status. And if they invented medical diseases, they could put on their white coats and qualify as real scientists, just like Pinocchio wanting to be a real boy. Real psychiatrists, however, never cared about this. They understood that psychiatry is different, where the medical model does not apply. When I was a psychiatric resident in the early 70s, it was fully understood that psychiatric diagnoses are not medical and they never have been. At best, the diagnosis was a shorthand understanding that was intended to be an aid to the therapist in highlighting pertinent issues. All that mattered was the true story, the actual history. That is to say, his story or her story. Each patient would lead the way to whatever needed attended to. Ultimately, the art of psychotherapy is about feeling caring, and meaning-making. Now, a good psychotherapist does not need to be a doctor, but there are certain experiences in becoming a doctor that helped shape me in a positive way. The experience of dissecting a human body changes a young medical student forever and plunges him into the secret mysteries of life. To be in a position to make informed life and death decisions for patients breeds a sense of responsibility, and with some, I might add, a sense of godlike power. It changes a young doctor powerfully, and to learn about the mysteries of the body and the life course of diseases, to understand about life-altering conditions such as cancer or immunological diseases or asthma or heart disease, real neurological conditions, or whatever, it provides important experiences in grappling with the full spectrum of human experience. Eventually, all people get sick with something. It was important for me, for instance, to have evaluated a psychotic man and recognized that he had late-stage syphilis, not schizophrenia. The core paradigm of the psychotherapy of character is a unified field theory of human consciousness and how the brain actually operates that is consonant with neuroscience, myths, dreams, religion, art, and Darwin. The medicalization of the human condition did not begin with psychiatry. Humans have been looking to nature such as herbs and tree bark and drilling holes in the head for cures of psychic distress since civilization began. However, the cause of much of the psychic distress we sought to relieve is really to be found when we look inward to ourselves and to civilization itself. Psychiatry refers, after all, literally to the medical treatment of the soul, which begs the essential question of what a soul is, where it resides, and what it mean, or by what means it can be addressed. 
In my understanding, as the patient mourns the pain of his inner play, he writes a new script infused with his own authenticity and his own capacity to love. This is his soul, or in my terms, his authentic being. Now, when I was a resident, a senior psychiatrist who was influential in the alcohol world announced the, that alcoholism should be referred to as a real disease. He explained that since people make moral judgments about alcoholism, shifting the metaphor to real will help them not blame themselves or be blamed by others. And he said that this was just an innocent shading of the truth and will help people. I objected because it wasn't a disease. And truth matters. And words matter. About a decade later, medical insurance came into play, and it wouldn't cover alcoholism because it was an addiction, which it is, not a disease. In 1987, to deal with the insurance issue, the AMA redefined alcoholism into a disease. Do you smell the money here? But the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous have always been a spiritual practice. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. When alcoholism was referred to as a physical disease, it was understood as a metaphor. Then people actually started to believe the disease concept. When brain scans show differences in the brains of people who are chronic alcoholics. Well, sure, lots of brain damage going on in there. And this was taken as proof that it really is a disease. Didn't matter that people had stopped drinking, their brains returned to normal. The brain reflects behaviors. It doesn't cause behaviors. Once the disease model was accepted as an established fact, Researchers found pseudo-evidence that alcoholism is also genetic. Though not true, it has become accepted as fact. Now, the psychiatric diagnosis has followed the same trajectory as alcoholism. Each diagnosis, in turn, has been constructed by somatic psychiatrists as a disease. In each case, building a similar house of cards it doesn't seem to matter that the multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical industry and its influence peddling in academic psychiatry has been exposed as financially and scientifically corrupted and manipulated. The drug companies have engaged in study suppression, falsification, strategic marketing, and financial incentives. Take, for example, the antidepressants. The chemical imbalance theory has been discredited, but this didn't alter the fact that the theory is still believed. Never mind that antidepressants don't actually do anything constructive, apart from the fact that people believe that they do, which has also been proven, and in their wake, a lot of harm has been done. See, no, it's not the neurotransmitters. Depression is not a biological disease caused by an imbalance of serotonin. <clears throat> the brain reflects. It doesn't cause. Time and space don't permit me to go through the entire DSM-5, but each disease is a work of fiction. Brain scans showing thinned areas of the cortex in affected regions of the brain, which correlated to a symptom, are taken as proof of genetic disease. This cannot be so, or therapy would not magically reverse the thinning, as we know it does. A so-called landmark study all over the press is that a gene related to eliminating connections between neurons in adolescence is the cause of schizophrenia. Since neurons are eliminated in an adolescence, the new theory is that an overactive gene variant is responsible. And this theory is believed. 
then taken as a major breakthrough. But it doesn't prove anything. Conclusions in the absence of real mechanisms or solid and comprehensive explanations that fit every instance end up creating a false and speculative fantasy that is then taken as knowledge. <coughs> Excuse me. And once these conclusions are established, they become um, reified and operate as beliefs. This is one, or this one is already falsely established as it had been actually been proven that schizophrenia is biological. Evidence-based psychiatry is evidence in name only. There are two random yet typical examples that popped up on Google with the genetic discovery could lead to development of new bipolar meds. Oh yeah, cha-ching, cha-ching, follow the money. And the research indicates that abnormal variations of PDE10A19 might impact signaling of the C amp by engaging with another protein, restricting that protein's activity and its signaling. Once we understand how this protein helps neurons remain healthy, we might be able to develop medications to treat neurons when they function abnormally such as in patients with bipolar, such as in patients with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. These leaps are delusional. In addition, one study then uses a previous study as a fact and extends them, and there's nothing here but a house of cards. Now this does go on for quite a ways, because this doctor, well, I guess maybe not quite a ways. Let me, let me see if I can... I scrolled down a bit and I found that there's just lots of comments at the end. So, there's also, how about this one? Biomarker could lead to early detection of women or in women of mental disorders. <laughs> no, women are just crazy. It's just ask any guy, they'll tell you. A newly identified biomarker linked to mental illness in female psychiatric patients could lead the way for a simple blood test for improved interventions and treatments. This is according to eBioMedicine. Overproduction of Xist has been found in female patients with mental illness such as bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and schizophrenia. Disorder. They are living in a world of disorder and that's why they are depressed. <coughs> Duh. And about half of the female patients had abnormally high levels of Xist. That's X-I-S-T, by the way. And other genes related to the X chromosomes, which could indicate that overproduction of X-ist and genes from the inactive X chromosome are common denominators in the development of psychiatric disorders in patients. In general, the population of female psychiatric patients. This study's already taken as fact that these three conditions are diseases in the first place. There has never been a study where these assumptions ever turned out to lead anywhere. We have to stem the tide of somatic psychiatry and bring sanity back to psychiatry. A recent article by Peter Kinderman, Mental Illness Mostly Caused by Life Events, Not Genetics, um, and argue psychologists challenges the waste of research money in England which has been based on the assumption that the cause of human struggle is biological. We need to do this in America and worldwide. Our understanding of human suffering needs to return to a legacy of caring and wisdom. Our children's futures and all our futures depend on it. Thank you, doctor. That was somewhat wordy, but I am going to have to really quickly, I got to go check out the pig because I want to see what happened this date in history. Yeah, I saw that the, the um, Bitcoin was getting a little wonky there on the... 
somebody's messing with things again. Anytime things starts doing that kind of shit, I always, of course, paranoid much? Nah, not me. Okay, really quickly. Um, word of the day, myth, a noun. It is a whopper that achieved a measure of legitimacy due to its popularity among the intellectually susceptible. I uh, don't know that I necessarily agree with that one, Hambo, but hey. This date in history, the 13th of June, 1888, nanny state bloating increases when Congress celebrates Labor Department and creates Labor Department. God, I am having trouble reading what's actually written there. I need to learn to edit myself. And finally, this date in history, the 13th of June, 1907. It's cold outside. The lowest June temperature ever recorded in the lower 48 states is measured at Tamarack, Mexifornia. Two degrees Fahrenheit. Global cooling going into another ice age. That must be why that Life magazine started that bullshit. That's back in that time frame, I think. Oh, well. Uh, thank you, Porcus and Hambo, for those two things that happened this date in history. Let me see what they're quotable quotes. It's another from Dr. Hurd, so let me check this out. People compliant, or people compliment my articles in one of two ways. One, what a great article. Thank you for putting into words what I thought but could not say. And two, through calling me names without attempting to persuade me where I was wrong. Disgraceful, disgusting, shameful, insensitive, and of course, the obligatory racist. Case in point, my article from two days ago stating the obvious, that suicide is a choice. Thank you, haters, by showing that name-calling is all you've got. You've essentially told me, I have no reply to your points. I'm just really, really mad. Well, Dr. Hurd, you know, that's kind of the way life rolls. A lot of times, people that do not wish to have to take responsibility for their own actions, and yet they are special, they are very special, they will think that you are an egomaniacal asshole because you point out the elephant in the room. Even though they've stepped in the shit and tracked it all over the house, they still refuse to see that elephant in the room. So you're a racist because you pointed out. See how you are, you big old meanie poo-poo head. So, y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, Channel 3. I know I've kind of gone far afield and kind of been weird tonight, but hey, what the hell. In any case, I will be back on Friday for the Freaker Friday edition of the Rocket Chair. But until then, y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your wacka 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 doodle Wednesday. I was going to go outside and do some work in the yard, but I look out the window and I see the wind is a-blowing like crazy and clouds are moving in. So... Guess I'm going to have time to work on my blog right away after all. So, I guess I will see you all on the funny papers, in the funny papers, on the flip side, however you want to put that. But please remember, I really do. No matter how snarky I get, I still love you. may not like you all the time, but I do still love you. And I wish you all enough. Good night. <laughs>